the news traveled to um, Khartoum, the capital, and then they realized, oh, sorry, what's happening? A, a film crew entering Darfur, reporting on human rights and all of that. Who are these guys? Oh, permission, what permission? P permission was from the previous regime. Now the things has changed. Get these guys, bring them in. Welcome back to When It Hits The Fan, the podcast that delves into what really happens when things go wrong on the road. Brought to you by Battleface Travel Insurance. Now, if you're anything like me, crossing international borders is a necessary evil. I mean, the queuing, the paperwork, the unfriendly immigration officers, it's not exactly my favorite part of the travel experience. But if that's all you have to contend with, you should probably count your lucky stars because today's guest knows more than most about how challenging borders can really be. Reza Pakravan is the host of Amazon Prime's The World's Most Dangerous Borders, where he traveled the 5,000 mile length of the Sahel region on the southern fringe of the Sahara Desert, starting in Senegal in the west and ending in Somalia in the east. This expedition took him through eight countries and some of the poorest and most unstable parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Along the way, he encountered threats from armed people smugglers, saw the impact of terrorism on local communities, but also experienced the kindness and compassion of people who call this part of the world their home. As well as the world's most dangerous borders, Reza has presented and produced series for the BBC, Channel 4, National Geographic and Al Jazeera. He also, we might add, holds the record for the fastest crossing of the Sahara Desert by bicycle. We're going to hear from Reza in a moment, but before we do, make sure you subscribe. And if you're watching on YouTube, click the bell symbol below to be notified as soon as another episode comes out. But that's enough from me. Let's hear from Reza himself. Reza, great to finally get a chance to talk to you. How are you? I'm very good. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, no problem. And um, I, I should say at the moment, just like you fooled me, you're not actually in a, uh, a Swiss chalet at the moment. Do you, want to, do you want to tell us where you are actually in the world? Yeah, I'm in North London, Northwest London. And I sort of, this is my garden shed, which I sort of made it home office uh, when the lockdown started. Brilliant. Yeah. The last time we spoke then, uh, you, you told me you were on location shooting. Is, is that something that you can talk about or is that currently under wraps? No, 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 no. I was uh, shooting for uh, National Geographic um, and I was in Bolivia and Chile. Um, so, yeah, it was a um, it was a TV series that uh, we covered um three weeks of it basically there were multiple tv crews and then our slot was was three weeks fantastic and when, when would we expect to see that um i think it will come out next year early next year it's it's quite a long one so <laughs> it's uh it's a lot to film yeah and, and sure. it's, i'm not in front of a camera i was shooting so aha okay okay but of course now we're, we're, we're going to talk about an event that happened uh while you were in front of the camera and this was during the filming of The World's Most Dangerous Borders. Um, I, I, I talked about this in the introduction, so I gave a bit of context for people who haven't seen it yet. Um, but maybe you'd like to elaborate on, on the region that you were traveling through. This is the, uh, the Sahel region, am I pronouncing it correctly? That's right. So um, it was the Amazon Studios production. Um, we were shooting this documentary for them. I was presenting it. And it was about the, the world's most dangerous borders, which season one happened to be in Africa. Uh, so traveling along the uh, Africa's most dangerous borders to tell the story of people who live within those sort of a danger zones. Um, and uh, we, we looked at the map and we realized actually the most dangerous borders in Africa happened to be along the Sahelian belt of Africa, which is the belt that separates the Sahara from um, sort of uh, African savanna. So um, all the co co uh, conflict and war happens within that region, effectively. Why is that? Various reasons. Um, a lot of it is down to desertification um, and uh, climate change. A lot of it due to sort of a rise of insurgencies like Boko Haram, 
um, that kind of thing. A lot of it is down to like genocides in Darfur. Um, so that makes that sort of a belt effectively from apart from Senegal. <laughs> and, you know, a majority of these countries are sort of a, in red zones. Yeah, right. And you, this this took how long then to, to travel? It was it was 5000 miles. Is that right? From we should say from from Senegal in the west uh, to uh, Sudan in the east. Somalia. Oh, Somalia. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, that was yeah, um, took three and a half months um, of, you know, basically trekking, filming and, you know, uh, just moving from one one bit to another um, just to get in through. Right. And how far through this journey then did the, the, the situation happen that you're here to tell us about today? Well, there are various um, hairy moments. Uh, there were so many of them. That, you know, it is impossible to just go to these places and, um, you know, not somehow get involved in the conflict. You know, um, at some point we, we were held at a gunpoint by human smugglers in Agadez. Um, you know, in, in Chad, we got uh, into, in a very, got very close to sort of a Boko Haram stronghold, or uh, when we arrived in the southern, uh, sorry, the eastern city of Difa in Niger, uh, that was like, um, we were told to, to leave straight away because Boko Haram, like literally attacking the town and all of that. But I think the, the part that we got caught and it actually affected us the most was um, crossing the border to, to Sudan. Um, so um, in, if I sort of summarize it, um, we, we were in, in the middle of nowhere in, um, in Chad filming mm -hmm. and we had this special permission to, to after Chad was Sudan, so a special permission to enter Sudan from the east, which immediately entered Darfur. And we all know about what happened in Darfur. So in over the last 20 years, not a single film crew were allowed in Darfur. So we had this special permission to meet this tribe um, who live within this sort of a border areas. Um, and we actually didn't know what was going on in the world because we were so remote. So we entered um, Sudan, um, we were entering Sudan as the big dictator, Omar al-Bashir got toppled. So the regime change happened and military took over. So um, the government minder came to collect us um, with sort of a government officials and all of that. They arrived at the Sudan Sudanese border, and we were arriving at that sort of a Chadian side of the border. So those guys crossed the no, man land, no man's land, arrived at the um, border post in Chad, and the Ch Chadian guy said, uh, what are you doing here? Just, well, are we waiting for a film crew? And they were shocked because not a single soul has passed that border for, you know, you know the Western faces or, uh, you know, foreign camera crews um, for the last 20 years. Wow. Uh, anyhow, they didn't know what to do with us. They didn't even know how to stamp a passport and all of that, which took a while. So the guy who was came to collect us, a Sudanese guy, was carrying a gun. So the, the Chadian guy said, oh, so, okay, you can go and sit down in the immigration office, but what are you carrying? He said, a gun. So they took his gun away and they didn't return it to him after they finished with us. So we entered Sudan and this guy wanted to collect his gun. The gun was the guy who collected the gun was nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. Then he had to call the Sudanese authorities. So Sudanese military got involved, Chadian military got involved, a big meeting. Then cut long story short, the news traveled to um, Khartoum, the capital, and then they realized, oh, sorry, what's happening? A, a film crew entering Darfur, reporting on human rights and all of that. Who are these guys? Oh, permission, what permission? P permission was from the previous regime. Now the things has changed. Get these guys, bring them in. So we were, um, as the weather getting, getting dark, we were taken to the military barracks. And the next thing we know, we were handed over to the Sudanese intelligence. And um, we spent four days in under detention and questioning. Um, so under arrest, basically in a little, it wasn't a cell, but, but it was sort of a, um, it was a place that they were, they were keeping all the sort of a political prisoners, if you like, or whoever they, they're arresting in Darfur. Mm -hmm. 
got four days there and finally you know British ambassador got involved and um, United Nation got involved in all of that and finally we got ourselves out of there but it was that four days was absolutely horrible just didn't know what was going on yeah, so let, let me take you back a step then. I mean, you mentioned, um, you know, we, uh, the kind of party that you're with, the group that you're with. Who did this consist of? Um, we were a group of four people. So um, so it was a cameraman, producer, and a director. So uh, there was we were a team of four. And you, you were held in this, you said it wasn't really a, a cell, but, you know, perhaps like a makeshift um, cell? Uh, yeah, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't like that even. It was the little. Um, it was a place. It was a building with a lots of um, rooms and and shared sort of a facilities, which was absolutely disgusting. I mean, going to to each of them, it was. You have to think about it for for hours that to, to actually face that smell. But anyhow, um, yeah, and and whoever were there. They were in some sort of trouble, so they they were arrested. I mean, in Darfur, you constantly see, uh, you know, that the the big trucks moving with sort of a machine gun. Do you see the serious military presence, mm -hmm. and a con still sort of so constant conflict? So um, we were taken to this place that you know all the um, rebels, if you like, or whoever was rebelling against the government were held. It wasn't a prison, but mm -hmm. we weren't allowed to leave that sort of a little compound, if you like. Mm -hmm. well, what, what about then, you know, the kind of the, the processes they would have there for dealing with a foreign film crew? You know, were you um, were given any type of legal representation? Were you allowed to call either the embassy or your family or the, the producers or whoever? No, no one knew where we were. Um, so, um, the only way we could get a message through was um, there was a World Food Program next door. Um, so we asked them, so can we use your phone actually calling our families? My wife was pregnant those days um, with my sort of a, um, baby. And um, I was shocked that I cannot, they don't allow us to actually get a message through an, or, you know, calling British authorities or insurers or um, you know, the, the support crew in, uh, back in London. Um, and for the first two days, we were declined any form of communication with sort of outside world. Uh, finally, day three, they allowed us to um, go to the United Nations compound and make phone calls. So we went there and really begged them and say, well, you know, this is it, we need, we need help. And they were really kind. So they allowed us to um, make phone calls. Um, there wasn't any mobile phone receptions. Uh, satellite phones were taken away, mm -hmm. um, and we made the, we made a call um, and informed everyone, and they informed sort of a, um, their British embassy, and they they got us out. When you were initially detained, then uh, you know, were you thinking, okay, look, this could be a few hours, it could be a day. I mean, did you in any way envisage that this was going to be kind of a four day ordeal? No. Absolutely not. It, we, we, not in our sort of wildest dream. We thought we have all the paperwork. We have everything you can, we, we batten on all the hatches. There was nothing that could go wrong. Uh, we had a government minder with us, <laughs> which actually he also uh, was um, uh, under questions uh, by, the, by the authorities. Um, and he slept in the same place that we did. Um, and we thought, oh, okay, it's going to be a day or maybe a few hours and they let us go. But we actually didn't um, realize that the, the scale and the sensitivity um, of the situation. When we were put in the United Nations, uh, you know, they put us on a flight and send us to Khartoum, um, the capital for further questioning. Once we arrived in Khartoum, then we, we just realized what was actually happening in the entire country. They were like killing people and throwing bodies in the River Nile. Um, it it was a complete shit show. So um, it was a proper revolution, like street fighting and all that things going on. Sudanese sitting. I'm not sure if you remember those days where like lots of people were went and sat in front of a military. Military opened fire um, to all people and killed them. Threw the body uh, in the Nile River. Um, so and you know when we arrived in, they put us in a hotel. As we arrived, they were kicking out the 
sort of BBC, CNN, all these guys were journalists were escaping to the airports and we, we just arrived and we weren't allowed to leave the hotel. And then further questioning, and then they, they gave us uh, 12 hours to leave the country. Okay. And I mean, you know, that, that, that first phone call you made then from, uh, from the UN compound, this was to your wife, this was to the production company, this was to the insurance. What, what, what was your first choice? My wife. Um, wife. Because uh, that was an absolute emergency to, to tell her that I'm absolutely fine. Um, I'm all right. So uh, we had um, all the insurance that you can possibly imagine, um, you know, K&R, um, you know, production insurance, you know, travel and all of that. Those days there weren't any, there weren't any COVID. Um, so, um, but then we called the, um, we called the production company um, back in London and then they informed our insurer. Um, but I think, um, yeah, in, in that situation, we were literally trapped in there uh, with no sort of a form of communications with, with sort of an outside world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you, you said earlier that, you know, th- there was kind of nothing you could have done differently. We often like to sort of say, well, okay, look, if you're in that situation again, would you have done it this way or done it that way? But if you have every permission that you're required to get and you have very good insurance and you're with, you know, a government minder, you're with local people, it, it just sounds like it was terrible bad luck, really, in terms of timing. Terrible bad luck, absolutely, and uh, we, we we just didn't know. And uh, perhaps um, the one thing we could have done sort of differently because we were in such a rush to to get to the border and cross before uh, uh, before dark, um, we basically we were just keep going. We could have stopped at somewhere, you know get the news, see what was going on in, in Sudan before we actually get to Sudan. But, you know, because you have the government minder waiting for you at the border, um, we didn't know what was happening. So, um, and we, we just, we were in such a rush to get to the border, um, uh, yeah, before dusk. And um, yeah, so we'd be sort of a completely, uh, if you like, we completely ignored you know, the checking the news and, you know, touch, touch base with the base camp. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good point. So, you know, keeping on top of breaking news in a, in a part of the world, which is as volatile and, you know, uh, uh, likely to kind of change very quickly as, you know, um, the, the Sahel um, region, you know, it is, is, I guess, absolutely crucial if you are crossing these very risky borders. Absolutely. Because we were in such remote areas, I mean, we we were we were with the with a tribe in the middle of um, in the middle of nowhere, um, and it's a nomadic tribe. We were like moving with them alongside of the border of Central African Republic, uh, and those are the people that we, we sort of were documenting their lives, um, completely um, sort of detached from the modern modern world, no internet, no nothing. Um, and then as soon as that sequence finished, we packed our bags and just boom, rushed to the border of Sudan. And, you know, that's where we sort of walked into. Yeah, right. And, and the, the rest of the journey was, was relatively less eventful than, uh, than this incident? Uh, we, uh, well, th- not really. I mean, uh, from the beginning, apart from, as I said. Oh, sorry, from, I mean, the remainder of the journey, the remainder uh, after, of the journey. Uh, after Sudan. No, we, we, so we entered Ethiopia. As soon as we entered Ethiopia, you know, as you know, Ethiopia is now is in war. Yeah. Um, so that was the start of the war. So one of the generals very close to the um, president got assass- assassinated as we entered the country. So everywhere checkpoints, but it wasn't a sort of a direct threat to us mm-hmm. as, uh, as such. Then we entered um, sort of a, these are sort of a, if you like the military, governmental, political, then we entered Danical Depression, the hottest place in the world. And um, we misjudged the, the temperature, we, we misjudged the, um, our ability to navigate uh, in the middle of the desert. So um, we, we got lost, we ran out of water. Um, that was quite a survival situation, if you like. Uh, everywhere looked exactly the same. Um, right in the middle of the day, so you, your shadow couldn't tell you which side is the west or east. 
So um, yeah, but we ran out of water and we walking, we were walking in 50 degrees, literally 50 wow. degrees. Yeah. Um, without water for for about 45 minutes and 45 minutes with in 50 degrees is uh, is quite an undertaking i have to say um till with a bit of a luck with sort of a, we realize all the afar guys are sort of assembled uh, to find us um and we finally were rescued i mean i i guess that the temptation after um the the situation in darfur would have been to fly home and say, okay, look, let's just kind of count our blessings and not throw ourselves into any other, you know, very risky situations. Did that go through your mind at all? Um, yeah, definitely. Especially, I mean, when we entered Ethiopia, we, I mean, Ethiopia was going through a really nice uh, pattern of uh, economic and political stability. Uh, so we thought we, we left all the troubles behind and ahead of us is going to be a sort of a plain sailing if you like you know this mm -hmm. is the sort of an easy part of our journey but mm. um, we actually walked into Ethiopia you know um, obviously the politics was and, and and the rebels were causing trouble and then um, we you know got ourselves into trouble in Danical depression but yeah it's it's just part of my job you know it's it's um, you know you sort of sign up for these sort of things um and 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 you've got to find a way to deal with it and you know we can't leave the program up in the air and say oh well let's let's get another crew to come and finish it especially mm. when i was in front of a camera sure yeah and speaking of which then you mentioned earlier uh season two of the world's most dangerous borders what can you tell us about that if uh, anything uh, Riza? each season happens along in in, in each season happens in uh, one continent um, so obviously that um, that the second season was um, uh, South, Amer South America, Americas, if you like, um, but we haven't been able to shoot it because of the because of COVID and travel restrictions. Um, as you know, these days crossing borders. I mean, if you fly to one country, it's easy. You know, you can you can deal with it. Uh, it's not easy, but you know, manageable. Sure. Crossing borders is just so difficult, especially when you're a film crew and you're, you know, a lot of people involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and so everything has been on hold uh, for now for the season two. Okay, well, I, well, I'm looking forward to that. Certainly, I know a lot of other people are. So uh, yeah, as soon as that comes out, fantastic. Uh, Reza, um, thanks so much for joining us. A, a fascinating tale. Look, we're going to include a, uh, a link to your website in the description below. We'll include your social media handles so people can follow you. You know, we talked a little bit in the introduction uh, about just, you know, some of the amazing journeys you've done, including crossing the Sahara. But um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sure there'll be many more amazing German journeys coming up as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. And that is all we've got time for. We will be back very soon with more fantastic guests from the world of adventure travel, exploration, and more. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed, do that. But until then, goodbye.